Bueno, saludos a toda la audiencia que se encuentra conectada con nosotros en este momento. La sesión del día de hoy la traemos a ustedes con el soporte de Braki Academy, a quienes agradecemos de antemano. We would like to thank the audience that is connected with us at this moment. Today we are carrying out this activity with the support of Braki Academy, whom we thank in advance. Before we start, we will broadcast a short video in Spanish and then in English on how to activate the simultaneous translation for this talk. Antes de comenzar, vamos a transmitir un corto video en español y luego en inglés de cómo activar la traducción simultánea para esta charla. Instrucciones para la traducción simultánea. Primero dar clic en el botón Interpretación. Segundo seleccionar el idioma. Tercero clic en la opción Silenciar el audio original. Importante. Nunca debe de estar en check esta opción. Clic en Más. Clic en Interpretación de idiomas. Escoger el idioma. Activar la opción Silenciar el audio original. Clic en Listo. Instructions for simultaneous translation. First click on the button Interpretation. Second select the language. Third click on the option Mute the original audio. Important. You should never be in check this option. Click on More. Click on Language Interpretation. Choose Language. Activate Mute Original Audio. Click on Done. El día de hoy abordaremos el tema de braquiterapia adaptativa guiada por imágenes en cáncer de cervix intracavitaria e intersticial basada en resonancia magnética. Como moderadores el día de hoy tenemos uh, for al... this afternoon we have a Dr. Apollo Salgado, radioncologist, specialist in the National Cancer Institute in Chile, and the Dr. David Martinez, radiotherapy specialist from AUNA Corporation in Lima, Perú and Director of uh, Investigation and Education for Latin America of uh, Rayos Contra el Cancer. Before the lecture, we'll give uh, some instructions with respect to the dynamic for participating. The audience uh, will be uh, in silence in order to avoid interference. Creo 
Okay. Para presentar, eh, para desarrollar el tema del día de hoy, contamos con la presencia. For the, the topics today, we have lecturers from the Navarra Hospital Campus in Pamplona, España, Dr. Elena Villafranca, radiotherapy specialist, Naira Fuentemilla, medical physicist and director of medical physics. The contents of this webinar, as we mentioned before, is transition from intracavitary brachytherapy, interstitial, the advantages of hybrid brachytherapy and some clinical cases. Dr. Villafranca, please, now's your turn. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, and before starting, let me thank you so much for the kind invitation for this initiative, uh, this fantastic initiative that you're developing. Uh, we were working, we've been working with Dr. Martinez for the past two years, and I want to thank the Rayos Contra el Cancer Foundation, as Bracky Academy as well for the opportunity for allowing us to participate in this improvement, uh, something that gets us so enthusiastic, which is brachytherapy. And uh, our intention is to just to share some of our experience and history and also share our knowledge and uh, continue learning with initiatives such as yours. So thanks uh, so much to both entities. Well, the topic that uh, we have been assigned is uh, cervical cancer uh, image guided uh, brachytherapy, and we'll speak about MRI, which is uh, this is uh, the topic in which we are mostly experienced. This is our service, which is within the hospital complex in Navarra. It's a hospital with uh, different uh, areas, and this is the image of our service in the evening time. On the left-hand side, uh, this is part of our team. We're also, we have uh, Nayara that you'll meet later on. We also have uh, Santiago Pellejero, a physicist, uh, so important in brachytherapy. Uh, my partner, Amaya Sola, and uh, some other partners, uh, nurses, uh, auxiliary and technical personnel. So it's a team that is necessary for doing properly your job. Uh, this is uh, the schedule that will follow. So I'll start with the impact on brachytherapy for cervical cancer in public health. And uh, this is to show you some a few images in Navarra. And I hope uh, this uh, may help you to be able to come along here uh, whenever possible after getting over this enormous a COVID problem that we are suffering all over our places. And why is it so important to have a brachytherapy in cervical cancer? We know of this data that has been published uh, some years ago with respect to National Cancer Database in the US uh, with respect to the impact that uh, each one of the prognostic uh, factors had in survival. So we know that uh, it uh, began to concern us. So uh, the use of brachytherapy has been reduced in uh, cervical cancer and there is uh, an increase in some of the most sophisticated techniques for external beam radiation. But uh, in cervical cancer, we've seen that uh, uh, these uh, techniques do not uh, lead to improvement, but something really concerning is that women are dying more for, uh, when treated with the external beam radiation compared to brachytherapy. And uh, this uh, led to an alert, to a health alert that we always have to take into account. And for this reason, it is so important to know that uh, the best radiotherapy is the one that is about to save lives in cervical cancer. And within the best radiotherapy, fundamental part is brachytherapy. Uh, so for this reason, all of us uh, should uh, go for doing things the best as possible. Dr. Martinez also requested uh, me to put together our experience uh, with uh, 
uh, brachytherapy. So the experience that we started uh, in 2008, and uh, so we started in a 3D, and then we decided uh, to move to MRI in spite that uh, still uh, uh, there was uh, not uh, yet a great experience in Spain, but uh, we had it abroad. But anyway, it's uh, good to have uh, some knowledge on history, bracket therapy, how we've been changing from 2D, not to 3D, but to 4D, which is the one that we're dealing with, uh, MRI guided as well as scan guided. Uh, so we see this uh, first images of the first implants that we uh, that uh, they did with radium tablets uh, when uh, they were uh, uh, loading times uh, with radiation uh, measuring in time rather than dosing and uh, these were uh, standard implants that did not uh, uh, take into account the individual variations of tumors afterwards uh, saying the second decade of the past century, we progressed quite a lot in gynecological radiotherapy. Uh, there had been plenty of advances no? uh, before uh, reaching breast and prostate, which was later in time. We all know the Manchester system where uh, the dose was uh, prescribed in specific points, uh, uh, points that were taken by maintaining all the brachytherapy. Um, calculated upon orthogonal uh, x-ray films. The uh, dose was prescribed for A points, and then afterwards, uh, the IQ38 was uh, produced in 1985, and the remaining points to be taken into account for uh, controlling toxicity, such as bladder and rectal points. And then in Europe, uh, we had uh, three large schools with uh, three blocks, uh, uh, different applicators, but all of them using the dose calculation point, uh, dose calculation system, the uh, system uh, Gustav Roussy, where they used an intrauterine uh, area, a vaginal border created individually for each patient in order to uh, contain uh, vaginal probes, the Vienna University system in which uh, they use intrauterine area in the ring. In the Manchester with colpostato voiders and the intrauterine areas that I mentioned before that at least in Spain has been mostly utilized system. However, uh, do the planning still based in this applicator? So it does not uh, take into account the most important uh, issue, which is the patient and the tumor. They do not take into account the tumor anatomy. And for this, uh, we need 3D images and it doesn't take into account the tumor response. The tumor is not the same at the beginning of uh, external beam radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And uh, so uh, compared to when we treat in the first implant and we see different results when the second implant is to be made. So when we have a tumor with an excellent response as it is case in the left hand side. So this is a standard procedure intracavitary it'll uh, do so well. But if you have a woman with an extension, with a left parametric extension, uh, even with a good uh, response, uh, there's still persistence of microscopic uh, tumor and microscopic, of course. So we need uh, to adapt uh, this uh, to the uh, left parametric. And this uh, can only be done with the placement of interstitial components. So our applicator uh, becomes adapted to the tumor. We do not adapt the dosimetry to the applicator, but the applicator is modified, and then we adapt it to the tumor and to the response that it has at this uh, right moment in time. So which uh, clinical results uh, do we have for this technique? So we have uh, this uh, moment in time in 2020, we have solid data for this. And it is so different uh, compared to when we started in 28. So what is adaptive uh, brachytherapy? Just mentioned that is the one in which we look uh, to see what is the response that a tumor uh, has to initial uh, therapy, chemo radiotherapy. And we adapt, uh, we model and modulate our dose uh, uh, brachytherapy to this uh, tumor response. And also we pay attention uh, to other risk factors if there's uh, uh, greater or lesser feeling. Sometimes the gas contents uh, 
uh, we may not uh, control it so well, particularly in sigma colon. So we have to adapt our dosing uh, to the situation of these uh, organs at risk in each one of the fractions. And this uh, leads us to careful planning that necessarily may change for each uh, session, and this is uh, 4D planning. And uh, you know the four recommendations uh, that uh, yeah, uh, Jack Estro did uh, starting in 2005, uh, moving uh, up to 2011, uh, reviewing each of the aspects that has to be known with respect to contour, tumor volume, uh, GTV, high-risk GTV, intermediate uh, risk, uh, organs at risk, uh, how uh, uh, do you have to model them and with respect to reconstruction of these applicators and uh, planning of uh, therapy that although it's certain that in uh, planning therapy and this is uh, something that we've discussed quite a lot, the instructions are uh, quite scarce. And uh, last but not least, uh, some ideas and some comments about how MRI images uh, should be taken for planning brachytherapy. So this is indispensable to have these studies uh, for any team that uh, may want to work in cervical cancer brachytherapy. And uh, these uh, recommendations uh, were picked up uh, quite uh, detailed in the last uh, report ICRU report and uh, which data do we have supported by evidence so we have uh, really relevant data we have three blocks of study so there's uh, much more uh, data from institutional studies uh, studies with uh, smaller numbers of patients and uh, I'll just uh, mention these which are the reference studies in in which we have plenty of published data. The first study that uh, was uh, placed was the EMBRACE uh, uh, study. Uh, here we have the retro EMBRACE. The first study uh, was the EMBRACE, which is a prospective uh, study in which they picked up all patients that were treated with brachytherapy uh, guided by MRI images. It was an observational study. It was not intervention study. So consequently, there is variation with respect to radio, external beam radiotherapy, there are variations even in uh, fraction for brachytherapy. But the truth is that most of the centers adopted the four, uh, seven gray fractions for brachytherapy. In a second time, the uh, retro embrace study was started. And what is this all about? And this uh, wanted to pick up the experience of a patient treated with brachytherapy guided by MRI from the centers that were participating in the EMBRACE trial prior to entrance uh, on the study. For example, us who started uh, treating in 2008 and up to 2011, we did not enter to EMBRACE and the women that were treated in 2008 to 2011 were included in, uh, included in EMBRACE and the uh, rest in a prospective manner were included in this EMBRACE study. The study finished in 2015 and uh, we have plenty of data from that that has been reported in Congresses and published. Uh, so now we are uh, running this EMBRACE 2. This is an interventional study, prospective uh, study, where they designed both the radio, external radiotherapy based on a modulated uh, dose intensity and they also designed the uh, image guided, uh, MRI guided uh, brachytherapy. And this is, uh, I think that's the most important slide that I'll comment on. Which uh, recommendations do we have uh, for those? So these are the recommendations for uh, uh, those uh, gray equivalents proposed by Embrace2. And uh, we have here some peculiar, uh, feature, peculiar features. And there are some objectives, you know, some goals and some limits uh, to be complied with. Limits are the ones that we already know that have shown to have an impact uh, well for local control or toxicity. But uh, you have to place objectives. In the case of tumor, you place objectives, you know, a dose escalation, particularly for uh, tumors in which we've been uh, right at the point uh, previously, 
or others for those escalation increasing the interstitial component, but also it is quite important. We have those recommendations for the risk organs at risk, which are these limits, but uh, we place objectives that sometimes may be ambitious and costly in order to reduce uh, toxicity fundamentally in uh, these uh, women with a good response in which we have to preserve and reduce toxicity from not only severe toxicity, but moderate or mild toxicity as well. So what does uh, IGABT has shown? It has shown better clinical control compared to 2D brachytherapy. What's the evidence since the uh, institutional uh, small phase three French study that uh, use uh, brachytherapy 2D lacking 3D, but anyway, the results of the embrace and red from brace. In lock and control, the results are really important and quite uh, superior to data published by trials from the 90s with uh, brachytherapy, with the uh, 2D images, uh, local control. We see, for example, that fundamentally uh, what we find is uh, stages 2B, that's uh, around 90%, but uh, 3 and 4A, we have 73 and 86%. And uh, fundamentally, in these uh, women, the interstitial component has contributed with uh, plenty of benefit. In a retro embrace, in these uh, women, seeing retrospectively, there was an increasing survival because uh, here we have uh, plenty of elements and 10% uh, compared to historical series. So improving local control in cervical cancer has an impact, significant impact in survival. So. These are uh, some of the images of the publication from Retro Embrace, uh, which came out in uh, 2016, more than 700 women. And the overall figures for local control, pelvic control and survival are uh, dissected according to stages with some uh, toxicity indexes and grade uh, three to severe toxicity that are so low and much smaller compared uh, with the uh, stuff that has been published in uh, bracket therapy to the trials with uh, doses less than 70 gray dose equivalent. So what do we know from Embrace 1? You know that this uh, study started uh, being a European uh, trial. It was uh, widened uh, to India and also to North America. And uh, now we know that uh, there is a correlation, a direct uh, correlation between the doses that we administer and the possibility for a, a tumor control. And uh, with respect to retro embrace, the dose above 85 uh, grays and uh, administered in a short uh, period of time below 52 days, uh, this obtains the best results, 94%. Uh, with uh, small volumes, 93 intermediate up to 30, and more than 86% in large size tumors, uh, that means 70 cc uh, as a mean. We also know that if we delay our therapy, then we should escalate those. Uh, consequently, if we escalate those, uh, there's greater risk of toxicity, and we would not delay, would not have to delay therapy. Have to have time below 52 days of total therapy. And we also know that uh, high volume tumors and a high risk, they do require high doses. And uh, we can achieve this only with brachytherapy combined in the cavitary interstitial. interstitial. We can uh, deal with these situations only by this means. And these are some graphs that uh, pick up what I've been presenting with respect to the relationship uh, between volume and the uh, tumor control, but also with respect to dose. So from the retro embrace uh, study, they compared in patients with a residual tumor with high risk uh, CTV because uh, high risk CTV is not a GTV, which is residual tumor, but also encompasses cervix and residual areas, uh, parametria, vagina that initially were affected, and they persist as uh, gray residual areas in the MRI. 
So in this woman in which uh, they treated with uh, interstitial brachytherapy, they reached uh, local control 10% uh, higher compared to those women in which uh, only endocavitary brachytherapy could be made. And this without increasing toxicity, say rectal toxicity, bladder and sigmoid toxicity, because it was uh, done in a controlled fashion, uh, checking out the doses between the risk groups, and there was no increased toxicity uh, by increasing the dosing in these women. The second objective, uh, first we have to cure uh, these uh, ladies, but uh, on top of curing, we have to take care of them and we have to be careful for avoiding toxicity. We already know what is the impact of uh, you have data on impact on uh, reduction of complications that uh, has been shown with the uh, incorporation of this new technique. Uh, this is the small French study, but it's so important that I wanted to mention this uh, comparison brachytherapy 2D versus 3D, 50% reduction in uh, greater three and four uh, morbidity. With respect to retro embrace, so we lowered figures that were uh, around 15, 18% of uh, grade three toxicity to these uh, figures in this retro embrace. Uh, urinary 5%, rectal 7%, vagina 5%, and even in the embrace trial, uh, prospective uh, study and posterior study where doses have been modulated uh, a bit upon organs such as the bladder, uh, rectum and sigmoid, and the uh, data show smaller figures. But it's important that we have objective parameters, otherwise we wouldn't be able to work. So we have to have objective parameters with uh, docents and dosing response. And we have this with the publications that have appeared from Embrace uh, studies. And this uh, first paper that was published in 2016 with respect to toxicity, uh, rectal toxicity. So we see that uh, women in which uh, they were able to obtain uh, uh, DVCC uh, below 75 gray and equivalent. Uh, so we have from zero to 0.5 to 2.5 2.5 percent fistula but it happen it may happen when doses uh, so are so high but we shouldn't pay attention only to fistula this is a severe complication but women when we ask uh, quality of life questioners uh, what do they complain they complain because of moderate uh, toxicity and this is something that we have to learn to pick up uh, so properly and we uh, sometimes uh, we do not ask all the questions but anyway it's picked up with quality of life questionnaires and we see proctitis which is uh, something very cumbersome for patients. Then uh, we see when uh, D2 and C is uh, below 65, the risk is two times uh, less for developing such complication. Now, with respect to toxicity, urinary toxicity, we pick up the same data. There are some low indexes for uh, cystitis in, uh, for bleeding that uh, uh, once again are correlated with doses in the bladder, uh, doses in between uh, C bladder, you have to correct to, to gray equivalents. And uh, this uh, publication oriented us uh, saying that uh, late urinary complications are related with uh, uh, doses uh, uh, below 80 grades. So we left these uh, recommendations. We started with embrace one uh, recommendations on bladder allowed uh, uh, did to up to 90. But uh, now it is known that we have to descalate the dose because this toxicity is uh, significantly less when we are below 80 gray or, this, uh, or it's equivalent. So this is a new reference value for bladder. And with respect to Vaginal toxicity, the truth is, uh, uh, this is about the publication that have appeared and this is from uh, last year meeting and I think that it's uh, a good idea to delay publication. There's uh, plenty of studies uh, uh, that we speak on our annual meetings and uh, what about vaginal toxicity and the impact that this has on sex life for these uh, women. This is a first study in which they correlated the dose in the Vaginal point with the vaginal toxicity, but there are some other parameters. Those in uh, lateral uh, 
vaginal uh, points, you know, depending on the vaginal length. So in some points that we calculate both for external beam radiation or for bracket therapy, which are the PIPs are the points related to different uh, length of the vagina, proximal vagina, middle or distal. And uh, all of this uh, seems uh, to uh, result in uh, data about something uh, so important as it is the case for vaginal toxicity and the consequences that this may have in quality of life of patients. So all of our experiences are based uh, in MRI and uh, Elena and uh, David uh, contacted with us and I explained them that uh, we were not able to contribute with uh, plenty of experience with scans. Since from the very first patient, we opted uh, for doing uh, MRI guided planning and we were so lucky or having available this study, we have a small community with small numbers of patients uh, with a large uh, gynecology team and uh, with plenty of motivation. So it's not only us, but the whole team that was motivated and then get to the job. But it is true also that in all hospitals do not have the same availability and in, uh, in others there may be good uh, availability. And there's not much publication that I found with respect to brachytherapy where they use uh, MRI performed uh, just uh, before brachytherapy as uh, fusion images on the scans uh, where planning is made. So this can be an option, in my opinion, when we have tumors with good response. But uh, truly speaking, when we have an implant, interstitial implant uh, together with endocavitary, there may be plenty of variations in fusion, as well as in quality of fusion. And this may have an impact in the doses upon uh, risk uh, organs at risk. Uh, of course, there are centers uh, with plenty of experience that may have this uh, solved. Uh, these guidelines uh, are also interesting, as uh, you know, these are uh, ABS uh, guidelines uh, for uh, countries where there are some difficulties for uh, using these uh, MRI images. But in these, uh, they insist in that uh, you may use the image that is available optimal images, MRI, if not a possible scan or even ultrasonography. There are some interesting studies with uh, planning according to ultrasonography, fundamentally an Australian group, in that uh, all of this is uh, much better compared to 2D planning. So uh, consequently, we uh, should uh, take this uh, step for using this image technique that uh, may favor us for uh, seeing the tumor because in this uh, 2D image, we can only see the applicator. And uh, last but not least, uh, a few about our experience and all of our clinical results. So let me tell you how we started and uh, how we uh, based and how we've been uh, looking our applicators and uh, how a bit of our clinical results. Uh, in uh, now this is uh, Navarra, a very small area in Spain. Pamplona is the capital city. And uh, it's uh, 250,000 inhabitants. This is uh, the old door. Uh, our uh, building uh, used to be the most modern, but we have a new building now and we are located in an area in a hospital complex near to the university clinic and uh, next to the Navarra University and the public university, Navarra, Pamplona. This is Navarra University and this is public university. So we are halfway between the two university complexes. This is our service. Uh, this is one of the photos that we like the most, although the door is uh, this. Uh, this is the entrance door, but this is the image that we like the most. And uh, in our uh, community, it has been mentioned that it uh, has a population. This uh, diagnostic data, we have uh, 150 gynecological tumors per year and 25 to 30 correspond to cervical cancer. 
and the 50% correspond to advanced uh, tumors. Navarra is one of the uh, communities with the smallest uh, incidence of uh, cervical cancer in Spain and also with uh, rates that are so low with respect to the rest of Europe. So uh, here you see the tumor uh, and uh, many of the people uh, participating, particularly those from South American countries. So this uh, may be the first place to come uh, or the in the first uh, tumor in frequency, which is constitutes a real public health uh, problem. In 2001, we started the gynecological tumor committee. And in 2018, our hospital uh, gave a management uh, entity uh, constituting the multidisciplinary unit for gynecological cancer. So let me introduce some of the members and uh, particularly these uh, people that have uh, plenty of experience as well as some young people, as it is the case of our residents that are almost done. And uh, so it was the push by this uh, multidisciplinary committee that led us to do a proper job. With respect to our uh, brachytherapy section, uh, we introduced the team or part of the team at the beginning. I think that we're a very good team that we do work so well and quite a lot. Uh, this is our distribution for uh, procedures uh, as it is in all the places in Europe, uh, prostate, uh, uh, plays an important role, but the gynecological uh, tumors are second. Uh, together with breast, we have some other uh, pathologies less frequently, esophagus, bronchi, rectum. And uh, we have a program, a beautiful brachy intraoperative brachytherapy, a program for uh, recurring tumors in pelvis, gynecological and rectum and bladder, uh, sarcoma program in uh, perioperative brachytherapy in skin that in Spain also is an indication that is increasing. And uh, this is our team. Here uh, we have uh, two and a half, two radiophysicists running one place to the other and three nurses that we have uh, with us. Uh, we have the two rooms, uh, general surgical room that is in the same building and uh, the is uh, for all uh, brachytherapy procedures, uh, but uh, particularly a complete uh, surgery and uh, brachyoperative uh, operative brachytherapy and an uh, operating room where we do all uh, uh, procedures, flexitron, and a high dose rate uh, for prostate that we perform the same room. And uh, we have this. Uh, uh, posts uh, in the case of administrative area we wanted to integrate uh, with the eclipse uh, network uh, and uh, we also have a, a coding system uh, giving a response to this uh, service uh, for procedures that uh, we do our first uh, procedure we did the first uh, procedure in april the 23rd this is wrong and this is not May as it is written. It was April the 23rd in St. Jordi. We did the procedure of the first woman uh, treating a vaginal uh, dome. And the second was a patient with a cervical cancer that we treated at 1 a.m. No, Spain time. So it was not easy to start with resonance. We started interstitial brachytherapy in 2011 and we participated, were actively participating in this embrace studies. And what did we do? So we started to study. We have cleared that we had to explore patients and we learned to report a physical exploration according to stages. And uh, we're, uh, these are the objectives uh, for defining tumor location and uh, what's the measurement for all of this. We also wanted to study why resonance, why scanner. There's uh, multiple uh, modality, uh, multiple uh, publications comparing MRI uh, versus CT. And uh, I, we think we chose the best uh, pathway. We learned that the image variation and the relationship between uh, tumor and high-risk GTV with high risk is quite superior with MRI. And as I mentioned before, we have the cooperation of X-ray department and the tumor committee and 
Uh, we started studying MRI and we studied this with the radiologists and they uh, uh, lived with us all uh, brachytherapy. We learned normal anatomics, the location of each uh, parts of the cervix, uh, where you see the uterine artery, where the vagina starts, what is a parametrium, how you see it. And uh, then we started to learn uh, for example, uh, with a uh, suspicious cervical extension MRI, knowing some tumor. No, at the beginning it was uh, only with the radiologist, but now we had to learn to go on our own. No, learn about the images, how to limit it, and how when the lesion is intracervical, when it hasn't crossed the stromal line, when there is tension towards the myometrium, when the, we have a preserved stromal line in this right parameter and it rotates towards the left or when we have uh, infiltration towards the pelvic wall, even in the internal iliac and leading to 3D stage. So we had to learn all of this. So what are the applicators? So we started with uh, Fletcher in 2008. In 2011, Electa facilitated the outreach and uh, we started with the special component. Uh, these are uh, some of the images. And Nayara will speak on this and the needles. We did an adaptation, no? From the Muppet uh, Classic and we did an adaptation of our own with the material allowing us to place it in the MRI because the Muppet from Electa wouldn't allow us to do so and, and it was indispensable to use this, uh, particularly on the cylinder zone applicator. So we adapted this uh, perennial piece that allowed us to place perennial needles in place of women in MRI. And in 2019, we acquired this jowl, uh, this jewel of the crown, which is the Venetia applicator, a fantastic applicator, which gives uh, multiple solutions with a parametrial uh, component parallel to the probe uh, divergence. Uh, the needles from uh, cups allowing to treat uh, vagina down to a half. The uh, perennial uh, component anterior and posterior. And uh, truly speaking, this is quite easy to use. Uh, we've uh, used it in so many patients and Nayara will show you a few things about that. So what's uh, your therapy schedule? So this is our sequence. So you can see it. We start with the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy, conventional schedule, uh, uh, plotting uh, external beam radiation with the IMRT technique. And uh, when uh, we finish in fifth week, we program MRI in order to assess the tumor response and then uh, redesign the implant, design the implant, which applicator will be used and uh, which uh, technique, endocavitary or interstitial technique will be used in this uh, five weeks. The women are uh, weekly assessed and we wait in order to see tumor response uh, from the third uh, week on. And this is uh, some of the characteristics of our MRI that are picked up here. The only thing that I want to mention here is that it is recommended that the MRI sequences, uh, we use uh, T2, T2, uh, T1 is missing, and uh, the idea is to have paraaxial, parasagittal, paracoronal uh, sequences with respect to the applicator, not with respect to the patient. That's important for uh, reconstruction and for uh, contouring. We have some uh, limitations for uh, spacing, uh, we still do not have 3D images, but uh, we hope to have it soon. Now, with the respect to the applicator placement, we use uh, the ultrasonography guidance. Uh, there's a possibility of uh, being guided by abdominal ultrasonography or rectal uh, probe. We use the abdominal uh, guideline for the interim probe, then the vaginal component for the interstitial and uh, this is the one that we use for prostate in order to guide the placement of needles in this uh, parameter. These are the applicators that we've been using. And then we do scan. And why scan if we are planning with the resonance? We use the scanner with two objectives. First, 
to verify placement of the applicator, verify that it's uh, not necessary for uh, any institutional component. And secondly, and above all, uh, using uh, radio physics uh, for reconstruction of the interstitial component uh, that Nayara will explain to you later on. Since uh, at the end of 2018, we've been so lucky to incorporate in our OR a uh, sliding anti, which is a scanner that we have within the OR, and this uh, facilitates us uh, performing scans without moving the patients it, with the possibility of having the patient still asleep and see whether there's some additional modification. But uh, planning, uh, we do it uh, guided by the MRI, and this is uh, how the contour is made, and this is the base for reconstruction and calculations using CT scan as an auxiliary method. Well, after the first uh, session, the patients are admitted, and the next day in the second uh, fraction, this is something that we started uh, doing uh, for uh, one year and a half. We do verification with CT scan of uh, positioning of the organs at risk with respect to the applicator in the second fraction. If we see that there's no modification, then we treat them the same way. If there's modifications, relevant modifications, we have recontour of the organs at risk and we do a uh, modification of this uh, dose in the second fraction before uh, full therapy. Afterwards, the implant is placed and the patient is discharged. We used to seven gray fractions in the first implant. In the second implant, we repeat the whole procedure with one week uh, interval in order to have a total dose four fractions, seven gray each. Uh, so what have been our results? We published them in uh, uh, two years ago, what we reviewed until 2017, and initially we treated with the 3D, but uh, we, since 2011 with the RT, and uh, we picked up the experience on 57 patients. So more than five years uh, follow up. This is our series in our dosimetry and our results. Uh, local control in our global series reproduces what uh, came out in sprays, 90% uh, local control, 94% uh, in 2B and 70% in stages uh, 3 and 4A with a cancer-specific uh, survival around 34%. Uh, and for finishing up, let me thank, uh, starting with the Break Academy for us, it has been an honor to appear in this uh, map, this fantastic uh, map uh, of centers that are trying to do the best uh, we can. And uh, we agreed after uh, 10 years uh, working with ELECTA. And we reached an agreement uh, two years ago in 2018. Uh, as institutions, an agreement was signed between Brachy Academy and our Navarra Health System in order to promote uh, international training. And we've uh, done some initiatives last uh, year. And some of our colleagues uh, from Chile, Peru, and Colombia were uh, with us in Pamplona. And we had a chance of uh, learning from each uh, other. Uh, this year, things have changed. In our next uh, workshop, will we? Uh, 20, 21st January will be online. It will be an online initiative with contents as well, practical contents. Uh, this will be made in video instead of entering the OR, but with plenty of practical contents with uh, prostate cancer in real time. And also thank the Foundation Reyes Contra el Cancer for this initiative. Uh, thanks a lot for giving us the opportunity for uh, playing a part of uh, this initiatives that you've uh, set in order to improve uh, training in brachytherapy. That uh, for us, it's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for your presentation. Now, Nayara. And we leave the comments and the questions for the end.
because there are so many things to discuss. And once again, excellent presentation, Dr. Nayara, your turn. Uh, first thing, uh, uh, express my thankfulness. Uh, I'm uh, so happy to participate in this. I still don't have uh, plenty of experience in this uh, type of events and giving lectures, so please accept my apologies for that. But I insist that it's an honor for me. Well, I'll speak on gynecological brachytherapy 3D. It'll be more technical lecture about how we do the brachytherapy administration and I'll uh, point on physics, uh, physics uh, area. Well, this is me. I'm Nayara Fuentemilla, a specialist in uh, hospital radiophysics. Since 2014, I did my uh, residency from 2011 uh, up to 2014, and that was in the Navarra Complex Hospital where I work, uh, where I currently work, and I'm secretary of the Spanish Society of Medical Physics. So from here, if anybody is interested uh, in uh, commenting uh, any issues about our society, so please uh, feel free to contact me. Well, the thankfulness, let me express all my uh, acknowledgements to the brachytherapy and the hospital complex, particularly Elena Villafranca and Santiago Pellejero, who have taught me quite a lot. And uh, also they push uh, for uh, studying and learning uh, more each and every day. The service of radiophysics and the radiological protection that I belong to and to all physicists that uh, support me and uh, still teach me quite a lot. This is the uh, schedule that I'll follow. So we'll start uh, by speaking about what are the contributions of 3D images, then I'll speak a bit about the different modalities of images for brachytherapy. Then the, the, great, the core of the presentation will be 3D planning. And finally, I'll give some comments about the quality control, some uncertainties, and a bit of recommendations. Elena has spoken a lot about that anyway. So, with respect to some important aspects of what the contribution of these uh, 3D images, uh, first, uh, uh, basics, uh, it allows us to see the volume, the volume that we may want to treat or that we may want to protect. And it also allows to see applicators in uh, three dimensions. No? So with this, we may be able to optimize in these uh, three dimensions and also assessing the dose and the therapy generally. And this will be modified. And this will allow us, on one hand, to apply interstitial brachytherapy, with which we may modify these applicators uh, according to the needs of patients. And this will allow us to adopt brachytherapy to patients' needs at any moment in time. The image uh, modalities uh, that we have in 3D First, uh, we'll have to mention the CT scan, which is well known. Uh, not much is to be said about CT scans. We have ultrasound as well. And ultrasound do contribute with uh, accessibility, as it is the case for many centers, and the possibility for being able uh, to see uh, healthy tissues no, properly. Uh, so, uh, we, as Elena mentioned, uh, was the case for MRI, we also have to pay attention to ultrasonography and know how to use it. And uh, there's still plenty of job to be done on that. And uh, it's still in a development phase. We also have the ultrasound 3D images. Uh, this is less uh, accessible, and we have to learn a bit more about that. 
images in MRI that Elena mentioned uh, that allow us to the advantage advantage that it has is a, a good resolution and the contrast that it gives to soft tissues. And also we have a PET scan. Uh, PET and brachytherapy should not be used. This is nothing uh, interact, interactive, but anyway, it may be used as support, but at the time of brachytherapy, there is no place for this. So I'll not uh, speak anymore on that, so we'll forget about PET scan. In this chart, you can see this is a comparative uh, chart with some aspects, uh, and uh, we can see then the planner to the images, the advantages of availability. It is uh, quite fast in interactivity that it offers. And we want to work in uh, 3D, so this doesn't help. And anatomy is not properly seen in this image. Ultrasonography, as we mentioned before, it has some good advantages, but anyway, anatomy and the catheters uh, may be reached, but you have to learn it is not as good as it is the case for other image uh, modalities. So for me, ultrasonography is a second. Uh, uh, match and the first uh, classified, uh, truly speaking, between CT scan and MRI. From the physicist's point of view, as Elena mentioned, CT scan has some benefits, uh, and the MRI as well uh, is uh, the top because it has uh, good uh, gain. Uh, it is not compared to any other, particularly when watching. Uh, soft tissues, so we have to have first place for MRI. Now getting into planning, first thing that we have to do is uh, uh, reconstruct applicators. No, and this applicator reconstruction, this is uh, to reproduce as realistically as possibly the uh, trajectory and the images. So we'll have 3D images, so we'll have to uh, adapt our uh, methods for reconstruction to these three di dimensions. Another very important aspect for reconstructing the applicators is to do good uh, commissioning. This uh, has been um, recommended in any reference that you may see. Uh, they emphasize the commissioning, but I left it for a bit later on. With uh, respect to the reconstruction, uh, per se, this is what I just uh, mentioned, that you have to go for a good uh, start. And you have to take into account the modality of the images that we may use since applicators are not seen the same in all uh, modalities. But this is, uh, as we'll see later on, in these applicators uh, that we'll uh, have, will offer also some other features. Here I pick up so briefly some recommendations about the acquisition parameters for these different image modalities. With respect to CT scan, most uh, destacable form is that you have to be careful with artifacts that uh, may uh, be produced by metal applicators, you know, which uh, probably may place uh, some difficulty in image interpretation. And with respect to MRI, well, you have to point a uh, place in gray, the gray D sequence uh, T2, for example, which is the one that confers this uh, benefit for contouring. But uh, the applicators are not seen. Uh, uh, you see in the worst condition, but in T1 sequence, you see them much better. And when they are seen so well, is when we do 3D acquisition. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, as uh, Elena mentioned, uh, in our center, we have not uh, considered uh, coming down from this uh, four millimeter uh, thickness for each slice and increase acquisition and sequencing in uh, 3D. But anyway, we're doing so. And as Elena mentioned, it is quite important to do the acquisition slide uh, uh, parallel to the applicator. and. Uh, 
this is from the standpoint of the physicist and it is very important because otherwise these things may happen that uh, the slices are uh, so so thick or are not well oriented and then we introduce uh, some uncertainty uh, in our reconstruction on top of uh, doing the acquisition uh, as parallel as possible or perpendicular to the applicator this uh, planning uh, system they do have a tool in which we may orient our axis in order to end uh, by placing the cuts that we will uh, cut on in uh, parallel to the applicators uh, aiming to facilitate reconstruction as well there's uh, different uh, methods for reconstruction on one hand, uh, we have the automated methods, which are the ones that I listed here at the bottom. In uh, OBGYN, uh, in my experience generally with these automated methods is that they do not work so well. They work better when the markers are continuous and uh, most of the markers of gynecology are not continuous. And uh, you know, there's uh, different markers, some are thicker and uh, this uh, works doing sort of a segmentation of uh, CT numbers and uh, following this segmentation you may reconstruct the catheters so let me insist that my experience is that uh, still uh, there are so many things uh, we miss so anyway they did not compensate at the end on the other hand we have reconstruction direct uh, reconstruction uh, which is uh, so applicable and it is uh, much more comfortable to manage so this is what I'll uh, share with you now. For manual reconstruction, this uh, consists in uh, placing uh, together and reproduce the uh, pathway of this source. It has been recommended particularly in applicators uh, such as uh, needles or in case uh, there may be rigid applicators, uh, let's say geometric uh, simple geometric forms for example cylinders you have to pay special attention when you place the point representing the distal uh, position since this uh, may condition all the uh, remaining parts of planning and here once again i come to the initial uh, reference uh, stage commission and that i'll explain at the end since uh, when we do the reconstruction we have to attempt to reproduce the situation that we may have seen in our initial reference state when uh, uh, explain commission and you'll understand much better what I'm saying this is a video this is the same cylinder used before in which there's a reconstruction manual reconstruction we know that the uh, distal position the furthest place uh, separating from the source coincides with the centers of the first uh, marker so here we place a point in another below uh, you draw a line and according to these two points in this applicator and this may be enough however here we have another video where there's reconstruction of a utrecht applicator So I was saying that in this Utrecht applicator that is an MRI, you cannot see because of the thickness of the slate, we're not able to see the dami or the end of dami, the position. Uh, this corresponding to this detail telling us where the distal the position is. The, uh, in position so when doing commissioning we've been able to see and uh, to measure the distance from the surface of the applicator towards the first uh, stop the first uh, position possible so what do we do at the reconstruction we fix in this area and then reconstruct from then on Eh, luego 
Then at the end, uh, once we reconstructed our applicator, we introduce this uh, distance. You can see it uh, down here. Uh, this uh, distance that we're seeing in uh, commissionados from the surface of applicator in this modality of image until the first stop position. Another way for reconstructing the applicators is uh, through the library. So I brought here some other videos in order to teach you uh, to see how this is archives uh, three the archives uh, representing the applicators, and you may select each one of the components, uh, see how the interviewing probe uh, was selected, and then the different sizes of these uh, sections from the cylinder. Also, the Utrecht applicator in which uh, we select uh, one uh, Avoid per separate. If we may want to confine different sizes and thickness in the angulation of the uterine probe. And uh, finally, the Venice applicator. This is a uh, most recent uh, purchase. And uh, it has the particularity that the ring is divided in two halves. So we may be able to select and we'll have to select each one of these uh, halves. And we have these vaginal pieces that allow us to uh, treat the upper third of the vagina, the first uh, third. And then in some cases in areas where this is used to separate the rectum from the area of therapy. Well, how to use them? Uh, well, the idea is to do some uh, fusion for uh, points with respect to the archive of the applicator uh, library in our images. Consequently, you may define in this uh, some uh, points that will identify in our images. Here we have a cylinder, multi-channel cylinder with intrauterine probe, and as uh, you see, there's positioning of these points, and then you may have translation uh, movements and rotation movements in order to make it fit so well. We also placed another example from uh, Venice, in which uh, we do the same here. The points that we identified correspond to the tip of the intrauterine probing at the end, the uh, tip corresponding to the looming of the channels of these ovoid areas. And then we do this uh, translation and rotation movements uh, repeatedly. You can move them in three planes until it fits so perfectly in our images. And this is a video in which uh, this corresponds to a patient who's working with a venous applicator in which we used everything we have, the interstitial needles, perineal needles, caps, also because it's a tumor, a quite large tumor, in which we needed to use plenty of needles and all the complements that Venice, Venice has. Once uh, we reconstructed the applicator, then we moved to those optimizations. So first is decide the position, the resting position. In this case, since we have 3D images, we have a contour, we have the areas that uh, we want to treat, which are well known, as well as the areas to be avoided. Uh, even being as small as possible, uh, we can identify them. So we may decide then on the areas and the positions that we are interested on to activate, whether we're getting so near to an organ at risk or whether we have at a distance from this organ at risk and we're not interested in activating them in order to comply with uh, the objectives. In order, in order to optimize the, the dose ones, we decided uh, which will be the resting positions in order to decide for how long we'll apply the source. In each position, there's different types of optimization. One of them is the inverse, 
that I wanted to mention at the beginning precisely because this is not recommended for gynecological bracket therapy. As you know, inverse optimization consists in introducing some subjective uh, parameters, uh, doses in planning, and then and this may give us back a result. The problem for this uh, type of optimization for back gynecological bracket therapy is that the implants are uh, the geometric cells is so irregular, so uh, some uh, cold and warm uh, points are created in areas that we are not able to control, and then we have to use uh, plenty of time in order to correct them. And also, this may lead uh, to errors in some of these uh, uh, cold and uh, cool points uh, are not corrected, so this optimization wouldn't offer any type of advantage. So. The other two are used. The first uh, is geometric optimization, in which the uh, planning uh, planner takes into account the region that is uh, marked with this active exposure. And uh, then optimization is uh, performed, geometric optimization. So uh, somehow some homogeneity may be achieved with this uh, region that is uh, marked by these active uh, positions. So between these uh, modalities, uh, there's a few differences, but uh, anyway, in some cases, it's uh, more useful to use uh, the other one. Then, uh, direct optimization, uh, graphic optimization consists simply in looking at the slices. In this areas in which we want to modify the doses and then uh, stretch isodosis. So with this uh, method, we have to be careful as well uh, because it is easy to become a bit emotional and then create hot areas and the cold areas, uh, heterogeneously not uh, facilitating uh, this application. And uh, finally, We have this uh, modality for direct optimization through relative ways and times. Now, as you know, this uh, modality, which is the one that you use, uh, this uh, consists in uh, giving uh, relative time and relative ways with absolute time to each one of the uh, resting positions that we planned on. So once we optimized, now we have a, a starting point and then we have to normalize the dose in order to uh, say how much uh, dose uh, be at 100% of the dose to which area we want to give that particular dose. So for this, one of the most usual ways, which is uh, widely extended, is uh, using vaginal points uh, five millimeters from the surface of the applicator. And uh, here we see a case of a cylinder and a case of the ovoids where we can see all these uh, points uh, five millimeters from the surface. And on the other hand, uh, these uh, ECRU points, uh, points A that are two centimeters uh, lateral to the intrauterine probe and uh, two centimeters from the surface of the applicator. The process for optimization uh, until complete may be summarized this way. First, uh, we'll uh, have to go for optimization through relative weight, and then we may go for normalization to some point in particular, and then we would uh, be able to assess this optimization that we have obtained. And uh, from then on, we would enter in a bucle, optimizing and assessing uh, until we reach a result that this uh, that agrees uh, so that uh, this would correspond to the chosen therapy. 
when trying to assess the dose, uh, we have different uh, tools. Uh, first, uh, was already mentioned, which uh, consists uh, on slice to slice, uh, go and assess uh, these areas where the dose may be short, or perhaps whether we are approaching risk organs at the risk. So we have to look for areas in which we would like to modify the dose. On the other hand, we have histograms. And one of the things that we have to take into account when using histograms is that uh, uh, calculation mesh that will use, say, brachytherapy leads to very high grains and uh, dose, and we have to do a calculation as small as possible, so this is taking into account. And uh, small enough uh, mesh that from one cubic millimeter or small volumes uh, facing the volumes or therapy, it uh, does not uh, lead uh, to plenty of benefit. So this uh, is not uh, necessarily reflected in a histogram, so we would have to have a volumes of therapy less than 5 cc. However, when we speak on uh, organs at risk, it is good to reduce this uh, calculation uh, area to 0.11 cc because that's the parameter that it's uh, mentioned in the guidelines as uh, abs maximum absorbed doses. So this is an example of an histogram that uh, we have obtained in a therapy in our center where we see these uh, lines of isodoses in the, in the, so we'll see in this uh, 1998 of the organs uh, of this uh, therapy volumes and this uh, two centimeters or 2.1 of the organs at risk. And uh, these uh, from uh, ICRU 89, in which uh, they give us some uh, parameters uh, in order to report or to pick up uh, the doses uh, uh, for gynecology. And we see that there's uh, plenty of uh, volume parameters and also the well-known points uh, are mentioned, uh, particularly bladder and rectum and the vaginal, although they're not uh, present, the lateral ones, and uh, also the feet, uh, those that mention Elena is uh, in her lecture, anatomical reference point for the vagina. And uh, finally, for assessing the dose, we have a tool which is uh, helpful for determining when we combine uh, therapy with external beam radiotherapy. The tool is this, a uh, dose equivalent, uh, it is calculated by using this formula uh, and where uh, alpha, beta appearing here and uh, these others for uh, GTV, they're the target volumes, which would be 10 grays and 3 gray for risky organs at risk. Planners, commercial planners, they do not have implemented this option of adding the external beam radiotherapy to brachytherapy. So with this, we have to look uh, for uh, calculation sheets. Here we have a calculation sheet that is uh, used uh, in order to see which uh, those uh, percentage of those should be reaching each uh, one of the fractions of brachytherapy. So we start from the objectives marked by Embrace 2, which you can see in this right hand column. And then uh, by referring to this, we can see or calculate the percentage dose of each one of the fractions in bracket therapy that we should reach in order to be well within these uh, parameters from the protocol, from the embrace uh, protocol, but this will be an ideal situation. So we have this another uh, calculation sheet where we modify the parameters of each one of the applications. And in this way, we could uh, be able to sum, say, points A, they do not uh, appear here, and uh, some other tips, such as a volumetric thermometers, which allow us to sum the dose on external brachytherapy with brachytherapy per se, with doses of brachytherapy. And uh, it offers a color code, which indicates whether we're within the objectives of EMBRACE2. Uh, for finishing up, uh, 
a bit on quality control in the initial reference state. The initial reference state of these applicators, this is uh, new for you, and this consists in establishing the track of the beam within the applicator and with respect to the uh, unidentified uh, geometric uh, pattern it depends on uh, modality uh, image sometimes we're able to see it and sometimes uh, not we have to take into account the direction of therapy from the source and we'll see it later on i uh, brought you an example of an initial uh, reference state with some ovoids. Uh, here we see some uh, films, X-ray films that we did in which we measured the distance uh, remaining from the center of the marker towards the surface of the applicator. And uh, we are also able to see the shape that the dummy takes within the ovoid channel. On the other hand, we did autoradiography uh, setting some separate positions and also we measured the positions most important in this position and from then on uh, measured and this is down to the uh, applicator's uh, surface and this is marked with a uh, with a pen this is not the best image for this uh, particular issue you, this can be seen with other images in order to see what's the pathway of the source within the applicator and both were compared. So as we see here, this uh, pathway from the source does not coincide with the center of the channel or with a pathway that would be marked by the other parameter by the dummies. So we have to take into account the division in which the source is radiating because uh, it's not the same drawing it's not the same in the channel it depends on the movement when uh, getting in or getting out because these uh, forces between the applicator uh, walls are not the same and also we did uh, we uh, CT scan we did a CT scan of these applicators in order to visualize uh, wall thickness uh, geometrics basically and then see whether there is a uh, defect, uh, building defect or some erosion or uh, something that uh, may lead us to obstruction of the, of the source. This is the Venice applicators where we did the autoradiography in order to measure these uh, distances towards the line dividing the applicator that was a reference and also images, x-ray images with these uh, gummies and uh, with the uh, therapy, with the source of therapy. With respect to commissioning of these uh, planning systems, uh, just uh, brought here two recommendations on uh, uh, planning systems for general radiotherapy, but it also has a section on brachytherapy, in which uh, the most important point is uh, that uh, you should uh, verify the uh, 3D reconstruction through volume and uh, well-known distance with uh, models, mannequins, uh, calculation uh, of time, which uh, poses a problem of uh, geometrics, uh, and uh, some other characteristics from the source and the uh, well-known distances and to reassess these changes uh, in time calculations and the parameters doses histogram volume and parameters that are associated with respect to uncertainties uh, just uh, brought here a paper that is so uh, helpful for us work in the same area in which uh, Uh, well, uh, summarizing in this uh, chart is uh, uh, much of what has been mentioned in the paper. This is in different sources uh, for uncertainty and the impact that it has in dosimetry for a target or uh, organs at risk. With respect to the part that is uh, concerned for us physicists, the aspect that generates most uncertainty 
is the reconstruction in the applicators, which may lead to 4% uh, uncertainty, which is uh, quite a lot, but uh, this is not the source of major error. Uh, controlling variability, uh, into observed variability, and also the uh, intra uh, operation uh, variation. For example, uh, we insert the applicator until the images are performed. And since these images, images are acquired until the lady goes to the room for therapy and the, all the organs at risk have been modified. So uh, the, there's plenty of uh, uncertainty. So in order to avoid all this, well, upon the first uh, part, this applicator reconstruction, uh, first thing you have to do is uh, be as detailed as possible, initial uh, reference uh, state pre-commissioning, and with respect to contour, uh, uh, we have to have uh, plenty of training and practice, and uh, we also have to have uh, support from somebody with a greater experience so that uh, he or she may help us in this uh, learning process. Although this is not the only thing, we also have another source of uncertainty, which is uh, contouring. But what I want to mention is that one thing that is not uh, at a reach for improving or for reducing this uh, uncertainty in contour is that the thickness of slice for acquisition in uh, 3D, they do have a limit. And there are some risky organs that is the cecum or the intestinal loops that uh, truly speaking may have plenty of curves. And it's not that we know or don't know how to do the contour, but uh, this uh, curves put plenty of difficulty and this may affect our calculation for histogram and this may also affect our dose prescription. Uh, finally, with respect to algorithms for calculation, as you know, and what I presented is here, and it was uh, in this uh, formalism TR43, which uh, calculates as if everything was uh, water. Uh, homogeneously water and uh, uh, well uh, we have plenty of water but we're not water and the uh, tg 186 was published where they wanted to introduce these variations in heterogeneity this is one of the most known figures of this trans group for uh, wapm where uh, we can see the solution uh, for uh, different tissues according to the energy of the photons uh, passing through the area. The source of uh, video has uh, 300 uh, megs or so and the arteries in this graph would be in this place. So it seems that all of these uh, would correspond to a single one. This is reference uh, comparison with water. So we may think that the iridium source uh, does not have uh, major implications or uh, such a great impact. However, in this uh, other graph, a bit of physics, we see this uh, uh, graph in which uh, we see how the energy, the photon energy is, the photoelectric effect, together with this uh, peer production. In gynecological brachotherapy, the tissues, uh, the CK or the atomic number of the tissue is in this uh, area, in this lower area. And here we have the energy for our sources. As we mentioned before, the iridium source would be in this area. So mainly we would have the contour effect. So it may not uh, have a great impact, but these secondary photons and uh, we may be located to this area where we reach this uh, point where we may have some impact in the symmetry. Uh, however, anyway, 
it's not the photons the ones that the, will influence the most but uh, just to mention that there is uh, no impact because this would be true as well and uh, finally as it is uh, placed in this uh, image there are some of the recommendations of the available recommendations there's many more of them but everything that i place here is uh, with respect to cervix but uh, and all of that i uh, mentioned is uh, extensible to situations that do not imply um, or complications say lower parts of the vagina this is the references that i had used for this presentation and this is it a few pictures of irunia and i hope that you can visit me in person soon thanks for your kind presentation uh, quite uh, motivating. I think that uh, now we'll start with the Q&A session. So now it's the turn of uh, Dr. Salgado for starting the session now. David, ¿me escuchas? Sí, perfecto. Apolo, sí. Adelante. Bueno, tenemos algunas preguntas en el chat. Well, we have a few questions in the chat. We'll ask Elena and Nayara. First question is, uh, which is a bit of administrative uh, material. You explained that, uh, but I want you to emphasize this. How long does it take? Uh, oh, what's the time invested of an implant for a patient? Because we saw the circuit involving scan and MRI in which uh, the patient uh, spends one night uh, at the hospital and receives two uh, fractions of saving. And one week later, she's admitted once again. So how long for a patient is for having this brachytherapy implant? Do you do a booklet at the time of uh, resonance? Do you add it to the needle? or you place the needle and then you see whether you take them out. Can you comment on that, please? Well, the procedure that uh, we follow this uh, therapy schedule is five weeks. Uh, external beam radiation, we usually start on uh, uh, Monday and we end on uh, uh, Friday and uh, we do an MRI after these five weeks. MRI for assessing the response at the six week uh, with this uh, two day interval between the external beam radiotherapy, they enter for brachytherapy. We do two admissions, two procedures, two implants, and each one of these implants is divided into two fractions. Uh, Monday afternoon, one fraction, the patient is admitted uh, that night, uh, Tuesday morning, second uh, fraction, then reassessment. Uh, the patient is discharging at the seventh week, uh, same story, uh, admitted uh, Monday and treated Monday and Thursday. This makes a difference. With respect to the time for the procedure, the uh, procedure in the OR uh, takes one hour, hour and a half. The point is that we have a gap until uh, MRI is available, so this is not how much time for the procedure, but time for uh, starting MRI, uh, planning, administering uh, therapy, the, this takes on average three hours. So that's uh, time. I, before uh, having implemented the scanner for assessing the second uh, fraction, that's uh, the next day, then what we do is first we do the scan uh, physicists do a fusion of the second day scan with a planning for the day for the first day we see whether there's variation in risky or organs at risk with respect to the applicator otherwise we use the same plan is there's any variation you have a new control you adjust the plan fundamentally because there's overexposure to some uh, risk area and then we treat and this uh, 
May take uh, 45 minutes or 60 minutes if we have to do a new contour. Well, there's another question. This is for Nayara. Lo que es el cálculo de heterogeneidades de dosis en su, yes, uh, en, en su planificador. Heterogeneity calculation for dosis in your planning or is everything water? Well, nowadays we use only the calculation of TG43, which uh, corresponds uh, to everything as water. On one hand, we have one uh, great inconvenience that uh, Algorithms calculation based in TG 186, uh, they take uh, quite a long time. And when I mean a lot, uh, that means that the calculation with the TG 43 is immediate. It takes a few seconds. And with TG 186, the usual calculation uh, may take uh, even 10 minutes. On top of this, which, well, this is not a crucial inconvenience, of course, this is not excessive, but anyway, in our case, we have a problem with uh, our uh, plan. Uh, the graphic card for calculation is not well integrated, so for calculating a position, it may take up to four hours, so we don't use it. But on top of this, the main uh, reason why we don't use it is because uh, nowadays uh, the recommendations I still that the calculation is performed at TG, uh, TGP and uh, considering that uh, plenty of the milieu is watering, you want this report for research, uh, include this calculation with TG 186 and uh, considering heterogeneity in order to be collecting and reporting data, but the recommendations for procurement are still based in uh, TG 43. And the fusion that you do with an MRI, are you already working with Excentra? Well, we work with Oncentra, but uh, truly speaking, it's uh, quite difficult. We requested so many times Selecta whether they would be able to solve this problem because uh, this is quite uh, cumbersome to manage. And the simplest way for uh, doing the fusion is by doing through some points with three or four points uh, for patients. And it is important to take into account that this uh, fusion should be done with the applicator, nor uh, not to the structures, which would be easier. So do it uh, based and uh, pay attention to the applicator. Doctor Jose, puede habilitar su micrófono, por favor. Doctor Jose, you can turn on your microphone, please. En la parte inferior izquierda de su pantalla. Lower left part of your screen. Puede habilitar su micrófono, puede habilitar su micrófono, por favor. Ahora. Ya está. Perfecto. Vale, vale. Lo escuchamos, vale. doctor. Bienvenido. Muy bien, perfecto. Eh, well, yo quería hacer tan, una pregunta tanto a Elena como a Nayara. I, wa I wanted to ask a question about Elena and Nayara and also congratulate them for the presentations. Very interesting presentations. So that the first question that I wanted to ask Elena is that uh, she mentioned something that is so important, which is the use of ultrasound as a modality for planning and calculation. And I wanted to ask, uh, and the... Uh, why is uh, there's uh, plenty of uh, some oncologists when using ultrasound when gynecologists, uh, at least uh, in Europe, they use it for staging cervical cancer. There is an oncologist, uh, Dr. Van Dijk, I don't know whether you met her, and she's been using ultrasound not only for planning uh, or not only for doing the contour and vision and the implant, but also for planning. And I think that's uh, since 2008 when uh, both uh, Dr. Prada and myself were able to see in uh, Estru Congress. And of course, we started uh, using this uh, endometrial therapy using the stepter and the use of ultrasound for uh, planning. So I'd like to know then why is uh, there some uh, resistance, uh, or whether this is not recommended by Estru or some other organization. But the point is that uh, Gynecologists do use it for uh, staging, no? 
So if they use them, then uh, uh, you may also be able to work with that. Well, uh, I have the same interest in using ultrasound as you. This is a cheap uh, tool, mobile, and that you can use it almost everywhere. So that has been the case. We have years uh, working with ultrasound and cervix. Uh, we did a study that we already published in Extra, Extra 2017, in which we compared the ultrasound images and the rectal ultrasound with the images with MRI and with uh, plenty of enthusiasm, but we found some difficulties. And which are the difficulties? First, that the endorectal uh, probe that we use is the prostate uh, probe. And it is uh, short length in order to reach cervix. And that is uh, one limitation uh, leading us to the correspondence of this longitudinal axis. And the second limitation, that we found this in tumors with invasion, with parametrial invasion in tumors with a good response in which, uh, practically speaking, the cervix uh, would correspond to high risk with almost no parametrial invasion. We did have a good uh, correlation, except in uh, x-axis or y-axis or even when after adjusting. But when we had this parametrial extension, this uh, Access uh, had a very low correspondence, and that was our experience. And we commented in one uh, embrace uh, meeting, and uh, the same thing had happened to them. There was no good uh, correlation, particularly when this parametrial infiltration in these particular cases. But uh, it seems to me that it is a tool that we have to use. This is with respect to control, with respect to reconstruction. Uh, we have uh, difficulties for reconstructing the applicator. Now that we have the availability of this applicator library, so it may become easier. But anyway, it has some uh, uncertainties as well. So we have to work more in the ultrasonography technique. Uh, we want to work with gynecologists and 3D ultrasonography that they use. So we started a beautiful project this year, and then pandemic started. So it was stopped as well as the possibility for coming more people to do our But it's something that we have in mind. And we want to see whether improving the ultrasonography technique, uh, this may help in volume alterations. Uh, vale, ahora. Sí, sí, no. Eh, yo te quería en realidad hacer eh, un, también eh, una pregunta y un comentario. Also wanted to make a question and a comment. The question is uh, whether you've uh, used with this MRI the possibility of a synthetic CT scan in order to avoid a, a posterior CT scan. And if you had to use it, what, uh, which problems have you found? Well, synthetic uh, CT scan, I do not know what is it. What do you speak with this synthetic? Uh, a synthetic CT scan is, uh, well, I think that all the manufacturers, uh, they incorporate the possibility of generating a CT scan that is the synthetic uh, scan which is in an experimental uh, stage in the uh, MRI that we have here in the last uh, equipment that we purchased uh, with this. Uh, you have the possibility of generating a CT scan from uh, abdominal images and uh, generally uh, from the pelvis. There are some other manufacturers that you use in head and neck uh, are uh, images and this is with the use uh, of some certain software for generating a CT scan with the electron density. It has its own problems because uh, it has uh, some limitations, but the advantage it has is that uh, you are able to use the CT scan for calculating heterogeneity without uh, using a CT scan independently from resonance. Well, this uh, synthetic uh, CT scan that I never heard of, uh, 
well, I never worked with uh, this uh, MRI with this option. I've listened to this in cases of LINAC uh, resonance, but I haven't had uh, the possibility of working with this so nearly. And uh, it's an interesting uh, topic. Uh, and if you want to implement a calculation of heterogeneity, it is uh, quite interesting. No doubt, what I do not know, as well as not knowing the technique only from a surface point of view, so it leads me to doubt uh, with respect to resolution that uh, may be available, whether it's valid or not. Or uh, maybe other markets would be used in order to facilitate the reconstruction. But anyway, we do not have experience with it with this, and we I cannot uh, give uh, any further opinions. I just wanted to make clear that we do all of our action with MRI both uh, contour as well as applicator reconstruction. The use of the CT scan allows us to see the depth. Uh, this is what uh, supports us. Uh, but the remaining both uh, contour and planning and uh, doses on uh, MRI images. Is it the same with respect to the use of MRI uh, working uh, as I understand with the result of a volume after external beam radiotherapy, uh, you wouldn't go back to the beginning to uh, pre-external radiotherapy, back therapy. Uh, this has been uh, mentioned in the uh, guidelines, which is uh, where bracket therapy should be used. Bracket therapy should be done not to the residual tumor, which is a GTV, but uh, to GTV high risk. And what does it include? It includes uh, a GTV, it includes uh, cervix as a whole, from the most proximal extension to the entrance of uterine arteries towards the distal uh, extension. It also includes the, the remaining parts of residual disease that uh, would be present at the beginning, both in parametric in vagina and uh, persisting in uh, pre brachytherapy resonance or in planning resonance for uh, brachytherapy. So truly it's a brachytherapy resonance and, and how we identify this. If it's rest or uh, macro, we'll see it brilliant in uh, T2 sequence as well as in GTU cervix. If it is in the parametrum of the vagina, we may see them as a brilliant uh, GTW. And if we see a microscopical disease, we see it, uh, seeing it only uh, in the residual parts. And we prescribe the doses to the high risk GTV. It's true that upon this uh, GTV, high risk is that we have to reach our doses objective uh, 95 and 90 uh, gray equivalent. Uh, there's an intermediate risk GTV, and this takes into account the anatomical location from the beginning of the tumor, but it is calculated from uh, some expansion on the high-risk uh, GTV to these uh, regions, as well as to the most uh, proximal region of the uterine uh, corpora, to the lateral parametrium uh, areas and vagina between five to 10 millimeters according to the response from the tumor. So we do not uh, prescribe our dose towards the initial tumor. We prescribe them to the tumor in the brachytherapy day. Now, there are some other uh, uh, questions with respect to this particular topic. If it is uh, possible, how you see the future while working with MRI in the next uh, five years? Uh, uh, shall we move to more dense doses in brachytherapy? Are we escalating uh, those fractions? So where is this uh, uh, heading to? Well, the future, I think, that uh, goes together with adapting uh, therapy to patients. We've, uh, we've been in this for so many years and we'll descalate in some people the therapy. Of course, there's uh, some uh, pioneers with only three fractions and seven grades in tumors with uh, stage 1B, 2, early 2B, and then optimize in these uh, women with advanced tumor in stages 3B and 4A, the incorporation of this new 
applicators of this uh, Venus and uh, new developments that have to be made with these uh, applicators because even uh, Venezia, this uh, marvelous applicator has some limitations, particularly in the distal vagina, posterior parametria, the uh, region prox uh, next to the urinary bladder. So we have some difficulties, particularly in posterior parametrium or uh, rectal area. So this has to grow the development of this uh, uh, together with images. So our applicators have to be adapted to the response of the tumor. And uh, with respect to some other developments, say, I do agree with you, say not all of us uh, have MRI for all implants. Ultrasonography is a technique that we have to work at and improve this technique. And also CT scan, the Embrace group is in the verge of uh, uh, publishing a new uh, uh, guidelines for CT scan. And we hope we have them for 2021, advancing on this. We're uh, doing some uh, research. Uh, we have had the occasion of uh, having CT scan with dual energy. And uh, we're doing some uh, research in order to see how the images with dual energy. And also the development of uh, MRI or CT scan will have to be compared with the reference in the What's the percentage of interstitiality use? Well, the last uh, review that we did uh, in 2017, and now there's uh, more, it's almost 40% of interstitial, and probably we're doing uh, much more than that. Well, uh, Dr. Cesar Garcia wants to make a comment. Uh, thanks, uh, David Elena Nayara. It was one year uh, since I went to, Gama, to Navarra. Congrats for your lecture. The question is, have you progressed in the use of markers for MRI? just a uh, small progress. It is true that uh, we've uh, working with a Valencia group in which we're develop, developing some study and trying to develop uh, markers for uh, MRI and uh, the applicators uh, or the markers, uh, metal uh, markers, uh, are not seeing, they are seeing in black within the applicator. So uh, if uh, filled with some fluid, uh, this is not easy. And on top of this, uh, the difficult to see. So we had a project there. This uh, looks uh, uh, with the limitations of the thickness of the contour. And when I've had a chance of uh, seeing some MRI images uh, in a 3D acquisition, uh, you acquire them in 3D with a thickness uh, with a one millimeter or less. And uh, it's so beautiful how you see the applicators even in the T2 sequence. On top of the markers, the topic of the image in ultrasonography and uh, you see them with a the team, and it's important to work in that way as well. I wanted to have an additional question with respect to the integrated dose uh, uh, scheme with you, Glenar Bass, whether you differentiated those in these lymph nodes from the pelvis, uh, paraortic lymph nodes, use uh, prophylactic uh, paraortic fields, and how will be the sum of the dose of brachytherapy plus external which dose is used for this sum? Two uh, cc maximum points and medium points. Well, in the new uh, protocol of Brace Two, it is uh, well uh, explained. It has been uh, published, so it was published in 2019, and uh, it is. Uh, is so important for this type of uh, approach. And we're using the external radiation being 45 gray at 1.8. Uh, 
the volumes for lymph node radiation depend on uh, risk uh, criteria. There are three levels for uh, lymph node radiation, uh, the volume, smaller pelvis uh, volume, uh, minor pelvis standard for the common iliac and paraortic according to the number of lymph nodes detected in T or in uh, lymphadenectomy, staging uh, lymphadenectomy. And uh, when we do lymph node uh, boost, it's integrated when it's in pelvic uh, region. There's a 2.5 uh, fractioning in the aorta to uh, 0.7, and this is equivalent to 60 gray upon these lymph nodes. Taking into account the uh, pelvic radiation, there's contribution of brachytherapy. So there is a small uh, prescription. There's uh, some reduction in the prescribed dose. Well, we thank for this excellent. Uh, we know that uh, Spain is uh, quite late. And we want to thank you on behalf of uh, Reyes Contra Cancer. Uh, I did a small list of uh, authors of uh, leaders in brachytherapy. And let me tell you something that when we were uh, making the list, first uh, person that appeared was Elena. So we have to invite her and we have to contact her. We have to reach her. And now just want to thank your willingness and your time considering uh, these difficult times and, uh, and also invite you to participate uh, tomorrow in uh, new initiatives that we may share because uh, they invite us to join our forces for those of us who love brachytherapy. So sincerely, my thankfulness to all of your team and for all the time that you dedicated for this event. Uh, so many, many thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be between friends and lovers of brachytherapy, which is all of us and we hope we get together so many times because many to learn from each other thanks a lot well i'd also like to thank you for all your dedication and to BRAC academics for the support that has given us during this process uh, truly fantastic lectures and we hope to have you in new initiatives as uh, we mentioned and also invite uh, you to the next uh, session, which will be our closing session for this uh, series of 17 sessions that uh, will uh, complete next week, where uh, Dr. Luis Pinillos will speak on history of radiotherapy in Latin America. And you are all invited. We'll uh, send the link for access in the next uh, few days. And uh, once again, uh, thanks to all of you for connecting with us. Uh, kind greetings, and we hope to see you soon. Ta uh, soon. Take care, please. Hope the English was understandable enough.